Uh, we're recording this presentation, which I guess will be available uh, after the fact. So if you have friends who have not been able to make it, then you can share along with them. So are we all set? OK, great. All right, so mobile apps. I want to start off with the big picture. Uh, you know, why we're all here, why this is interesting, why anybody cares about this. <clears throat> so think back to 2007. Uh, how many people had one of those Nokia candy bar phones? I know I did. Uh, I had a little LG slider. Back in 2007, uh, phones were, were almost unrecognizable compared to what we have today. We had the small black and white screens, we had that physical numeric keypad, and uh, uh, sort of, uh, as Steve Jobs coined, the baby web where we had these websites, these text-only websites that tried to distill the internet experience down to these little tiny screens. And there were hardly any modifications that you could make to these phones. You basically had the option of putting a fancy case on it or maybe a clip-on um, faceplate or, um, or ringtones. Remember ringtones? 99 cents. Uh, so you could download ringtones. But other than that, there wasn't really much you could do to personalize the handset experience. So fast forward to 2010. And now we have these gorgeous, large, full-color, uh, multi-touch screens. Uh, we've got both hard and soft keyboards. We've got you know, hard physical keyboards, these slide-out phones, uh, and the uh, virtual on-screen keyboards. We now have a first-class web experience on, on basically all of these devices, um, even some of the, uh, I guess, even some of the platforms that are lagging behind have really good web browsers. Uh, <clears throat> not just web browsers, but also email and other internet services. And of course, we have millions of modifications available as to, uh, to us now. Obviously, apps, App Store, I think the iTunes App Store just crossed 300,000 apps. Uh, the Android market is going on 100,000. So there are no end to the modifications that you can make to your handsets these days. In addition, of course, you can also um, uh, down purchase and download uh, video, audio, books. Uh, the list goes on. So today, there are touch screens available, connected touch screens available on phones, cars, and I even have a, uh, a printer with a 7-inch Android tablet touch screen attached to it. And these interfaces are, I think, far superior to what has come before it. I think tomorrow, we're going to have, we're going to see touch screens on home appliances. Uh, we just bought a new washing machine. You know, right before we left for the trip, uh, of course, the washing machine broke. So uh, we had to buy a, a new washing machine at the last second. And the, the interface does still have some physical um, pieces to it. There's like this large dial. But it's set up more like a computer than, uh, than like a traditional washing machine. Uh, and I can't help but look at it and say, they should have just gone one step further and put a touch screen on there that was connected to the internet. So I could start it from, you know, I could know when it was done from here. Uh, it, it would be. Cooler. Um, we're starting to see signage, but it's not really prevalent yet, but interactive touchscreen signage. Uh, and, and I've got my fingers crossed for the Cheerios box with the internet browser on the back of it. I, I, I will not be happy until we have cereal boxes that, uh, that are packaged inside of flexible touchscreen interfaces. So I'm looking forward to that. So <clears throat> as the prices come down and the durability goes up with these different types of touchscreens, and, uh, and, and we have sort of the ubiquitous computing that's been promised for a long time is starting to come to life, uh, at least in the US. We're getting um, WiMAX and LTE rollouts all over the place. So we're starting to get broadband everywhere. If you combine that with cloud services, you start to get this always on, always connected, you know, everything is a terminal type of situation that I can't help but envision like, um, this fish analogy. So as time goes on, well, right now, this situation is imagine, uh, bear with me for a second because this is silly, but imagine a fish wakes up in the morning and is at home in his bowl, and then he flops out of the bowl, and he flops over to his fish car, and he flops into a bowl inside of the fish car, and he drives to his fish job, and then he flops out of the car, and he flops into his work bowl. That's what computing is like now. We have these individual, highly customized environments that are, that are specific to a purpose, but they're disconnected and would go from one to the other. And now overnight, 
the fish planet floods with water, the fish government floods the planet with water, and now there's no disconnection. The fish wakes up in water, swims to work, does his work, and there's no disconnection. It's all one thing. So what's gonna, what is, why does that matter? What matters about that is that the concept of mobile computing as we know it right now is going to disappear the same way that the fish wouldn't consider that he was mobile breathing in the car or work breathing at work. You know, we're just going to be always inside of this global I computer. Right? It's a giant interconnected global computer. So why does that matter to us? That matters to us because there's never been a better time to be a web nerd. Now, there's going to be screens everywhere, it's going to be connected everywhere, and the internet is, is basically supporting that. The language of the internet is HTML, uh, CSS, and JavaScript, basically. So with those skills, uh, you're going to be able to basically create uh, interfaces and interactions and rich content across this whole global UI, if you will. So very cool. So today, though, we're gonna, I'm going to zoom in from the big picture. We're going to just specifically talk about mobile apps. So small screen devices, maybe up to tablets. We're going to talk about uh, a bunch of different aspects of, the, of that. So let's start off with uh, interface guidelines, specifically for, for phones, maybe tablets a little bit, but specifically for phones. Now, it sort of goes without saying, but mobile and desktop are not the same thing. Um, the, the, Obvious differences are the screen size um, uh, and the interaction model where uh, you've got a touch screen in your hand but you've got a mouse pointer on the desktop. Some things that people don't often think about are um, that mobile devices are virtually always battery powered, kind of part of the definition. And uh, the connection can be weak these days. The, the pipe that you're transmitting data across is small, so you have to keep that in mind, kind of in the old days, like dial-up, the way dial-up used to be. You had to really worry about your JavaScript being, being too big or your HTML being too big, your images being too big. Um, not only, so, so the small pipe creates sort of a bottleneck for uh, large transmissions, but also you have to remember that the transmission is expensive. It's not, just, it's not just slow, potentially. It's not just a performance issue. It can also be an actual money issue. So if you have a, you know, a, a really large website and it needs to download to the phone, someone visits your website or your web app, they have to pay for that if they're going over their you know, megabyte limit. Unlimited plans are basically going away. So uh, everybody's going to have some kind of metered access, it looks like. So for every bit that comes across that pipe, someone's paying for it. And then finally, maybe, maybe this is the most important, I don't know which is the most important, but this is uh, really interesting, is that in a mobile environment, um, the user is very distracted. They are not at their comfortable desk with their inside of their house or their cube at work, there, or even their car. Hopefully they're not using the phone in the car. But uh, if, if you're on your phone, you're probably in line at the bank. You've got 30 seconds to kill. Um, there's a lot of things going on around you. It's loud. It might be bright. It might be dark. You know, they're, they're, you cannot predict the situations that your application can be used in. There'll be really everything under the sun. The, the person could be doing who knows what. So the use cases, I, I like to break the use cases down into these three. Uh, the person's either bored, they pull out their phone because they've got some time to kill. They're busy, you know, hectic lifestyle, multitasking type of situation, or they're lost. So you're in a situation where uh, unfamiliar city, this is my first time in a long time being to Montreal, and I, I barely have put my phone in my pocket. It's, it's constantly out. I'm checking for what's around the hotel, what restaurants to go to, where to buy shaving cream, you know, all these different things just immediately on the phone. If you think back to pre-2007, paper map, you know, it was, it was a radically different situation. So to drill into these a little bit more, um, uh, applications that are targeted toward a, sort of a bored user are going to be entertainment style things like gaming, uh, maybe Facebook, browsing around YouTube. You know, you've got some time to kill and, and you just want to, you know, sort of escape the boredom. The busy use case is typical for things like checking email, updating to-dos, maybe online banking. Uh, we're just really quick hits here. I, I, I keep on saying you're in line at the bank, but you know, you're, just, you're there, you're, 